Hey, what's up everyone? Craig here in the Grow Paradise Garden and this weekend shows temperatures dropping across the UK. So if you love tropical style plants like this, we're going to have to start preparing to overwinter the garden. So this video is my last opportunity to show you around the garden every single plant, how it's looking, how this tropical style garden is holding up in the middle of October before some of the tender plants like the bananas and colocasias start to get put away for winter and the garden transitions into its semi-dormant form for winter. Now this video is going to act as a brilliant list of plants for any of you that are looking for ideas of plants to add to your own tropical style gardens and you'll see how well they've held up for this late into the year in the southwest of the UK. So the plant that acts as a red flag, literally, the autumn and winter is on its way and I'm going to have to start thinking about some of the more tender plants is this Roost Typhina or Staghorn Sumac in the middle of the garden. Now every year it surprises me how orange the canopy turns and it's really beautiful. So when so many of the other lush greens of a tropical style garden start to fade, this plant comes into its own and really livens up the garden. And because this is a female tree, these swollen seed heads bright red seed heads will stay held on the tips of the branches all winter long, so it's really good for adding winter interest. Now, this Roost Typhina is served as a host tree for tropical bromeliads. Now, with the cold weather that's forecast, if I drop below five degrees Celsius in the garden, I will untie these bromeliads that are just tied onto the tree using wire, and I will move them into the Grow Paradise greenhouse, which is protected with bubble wrap and has a heater that will turn on if it drops below five degrees Celsius in there. But for the time being, I'm gonna leave them out as long as possible because plants are so much happier outside, in sunlight and in rainwater. And these had all produced pups and offsets and I've been propagating the bromeliad. So I'm gonna have lots of these for sale in the shop next spring. And they really do help kind of elevate a tropical style garden. Very, very easy to grow. Um, and they just add flushes of color and really unusual planting kind of for a vertical style garden even if you've got a small space or balcony garden. Now below that is my Euphorbia cross pasteurii John Phillips. Now this is a really nice vigorous hybrid um, and I've talked about this cultivar on the Grow Paradise channel so much. Now you'll notice that although the top is still looking lush and green and really nice and rounded, down the bottom I've been chopping branches. Now, this cultivar is a favorite of mine, so I love to propagate it and sell it in the Grow Paradise shop. Um, and all these young side shoots just show how quickly it recovers. Now, I think I chopped it back down here maybe three or four weeks ago and started to root some new young cuttings again to sell in the Grow Paradise online shop. And I will be doing the same at the top. Now, it will leave it looking a bit bare. This is why I like to do it in two stages. The top of the plant still looks fantastic while the bottom is recovering. Once these lower parts are as lush and green as that top part, I will then remove the top and it's a nice way to shrink big plants like this by cutting them back in two phases. It's a good tip actually, do the lower part first, let it recover and when it's sort of ready to look like a young small plant, you can chop back this part and you don't have to go through any period in the garden where it's just leaving a big bare space. Now I'm in two minds as to whether I keep this in this central bed in my garden for next year. It's definitely going to stay for winter because it is very, very, very cold resilient. It's evergreen, so it creates nice evergreen structure through the garden all winter long. But I want to add more flowers to my garden next year. This begonia in the background is one of the few plants that's flowered in my garden this year. So I'm thinking of removing this euphorbia and turning this whole central bed into a display of big, bold, tropical style flowers. Now you'll notice that this evergreen canopy has been a perfect way to hide rubbish in the garden. Um, every single garden has messy corners. I just don't always show you mine. But keep your eyes peeled because this is definitely being propagated. So there will be plants available and I may dig it up and use this bed for a nice big flower display next year to show how big, bold, tropical colors and bold blooms can be used in a tropical style garden. Right, let's have a look at tackling what I've been calling the tropical style jungle border. Now this border is 
at most a meter deep from the fence at the back to this gravel path at the front. It's maybe three or four meters from one end to the other. And just look how much we've managed to grow in this bed this season. It really does look jungly. And this bed, I've said before, is a mix of evergreen plants like that Fatsia japonica and deciduous plants like the large-leaved Bohemeria there and obviously these hardy bananas. And the idea behind that is that I'm going to get winter structure. Just like with this euphorbia, there are going to be plants over here that are going to look great all year round as well because I don't want my garden to be one of these tropical style gardens that just disappears in the depths of winter. So one of the first evergreens is this Areopetria japonica, which is my loquat tree. It's featured quite a lot on the channel recently, so I won't go into too much depth. But if you want something that's tall growing, evergreen, has big jungly leaves and flowers in late spring, and potentially fruit if we get a mild winter, then this is definitely a tree that's worth growing. Down below that is the Fatsia polycarpa green fingers, a great Fatsia form, evergreen, really exotic looking leaves with a deeply lobed structure to them. Down the bottom is one remaining uh, Persicaria runconata purple fantasy. Now this did form a great big mound in this area, but I'm quite brutal, I chop it back um, and it always recovers. It can become a bit of a thug otherwise. It will kind of lean over, touch the ground and root and you'll just find it spreading everywhere. You can see another bit there, so don't be afraid to chop it back if you grow this. Now, catching your eye probably at the back there is this. This is Musia wallastonii, and I believe that this is a yellow flowering form. Now, this is a plant from Madeira. At this stage, it looks a bit like an echium with this rosette of lance-shaped leaves. This will grow into a giant, so long as it doesn't get damaged by frost, and it will produce a cloud of orchid-like blooms in its second or third year. I've tried them in the garden before, they never get through the frost, but this year, with the canopy of the Fatsia and the evergreen loquat tree there, there's a chance that I've created a warmer microclimate in this spot, and this might stay frost free. Fingers crossed, I don't know, this is what it's all about, just experimenting and seeing. I grew this from seed and I've grown a few others as, as well, and I've kept some in pots in the greenhouse so that I've got backup plants just in case I lose that one. Now behind there is a heat loving plant that is just starting to show signs of stress from the cold weather. And this is Colocasia and a cultivar called Mojito. This is the first time growing this one for me in the Grow Paradise Garden and it's been a real doer. Now I've heard people struggle with this one. I found the trick is to give it as much moisture and shade as possible. Colocasias usually thrive in full sun, but for some reason this one has pushed out the biggest and best leaves once the rest of the border has filled out and cast it into full shade. It's got the humidity from the water bowl there and obviously I water my garden quite thoroughly in periods of drought. And it's looking stunning. Now the cool thing with Colocasia mojito is it's not just the leaves that are patterned like this. If you have a look at the stem, the markings carry all down the stem, the leaf stems, it's just a really, really nice plant. Now this one's completely tender, so I'm going to have to dig this up. And I'm gonna try and overwinter it in the greenhouse. I'll probably keep it in a dry pot, um, keep it above five degrees Celsius, and then I will start watering in spring to bring it back into life again. First time growing this outdoors for me, so this winter will be a teller as to how easy this one is to overwinter. Another Colocasia that's really thrived in the garden this year is this. This is Colocasia pink china. Now this is one of the most hardy elephant ears that we can grow in the UK and you can see just how well it's done. One plant has spread from here down to here with leaves all the way down there. They send out runners quite vigorously and because it's so hardy your clump or colony of these plants gets bigger and bigger every year. Now these were in the ground over winter. They survived quite a long freeze down to minus five degrees Celsius. And I'm pleased to say that this plant is so happy that down here, you can see it's actually producing a bloom with seed heads just starting to form there. 
um, it produces offsets so readily that I'm not going to worry about saving the seed and trying to grow it from seed. But definitely, definitely a plant that's worth a grow. Always very, very popular in the online shop and we're going to have plenty more available next year. Colocasia Pink China. Now, up from that is a bit of a rarer plant. This is Bohemiria platyphylla. This is in the stinging nettle family, but fortunately this is a stingless cousin of our regular stinging nettle. It has beautiful round leaves with these serrated edges and a really nice puckered texture to them. Now this has also produced flowers all the way down the stem. And I'm, I've been saving seed that I'm hoping is viable. So I'm gonna try and grow a lot of this from seed for the nursery next year. Now this is planted out. It's said to be completely hardy. We will see. Um, like I say, I've saved seeds, so hopefully I've got backup plants. Now you can see the leaves are starting to turn here. This yellowing from the tip of the leaves moving inwards is a sign that the plant's drawing all of its nutrients back into the stem and down into the roots, ready to become dormant for winter. So this plant is deciduous. It will lose its leaves. It will just look like sticks through winter. But in spring, it very quickly regrows back these really beautiful round leaves. Now these have kind of set off the unusual leaves of Brassiopsis mitis really well. Now this one is looking a bit beaten up because as we've had coastal storms here in the Grey Paradise Garden, all the other plants have been thrashing around and have caught the Brassiopsis quite a lot. You can see there's the main stem, that spiky one of the Brassiopsis there. You can see the impatiens that have fallen over it and that are knocking all of the other leaves about. But this has done really, really well in my garden. It's said to be hardy down to about minus 10, minus 13 degrees Celsius. I'd say this is more than doubled in height this year. Plants always do so much better when they're planted in the ground. So they benefit from all of the kind of fungal relationships and soil life, and they can exchange nutrients with the plants around them, and it just helps them thrive. This is planted out. I will wrap the main stem in fleece if we get severe cold in winter, but I'm hoping I don't need to. It has gone quite woody, and woody material doesn't need as much protection as soft herbaceous material, like that that you get on banana leaves. So bananas, obviously this is Musa Basdu. These ones have grown enormous this year, the tallest I've ever seen bananas in my garden. Now this is the main plant, that stem, to give you an idea, has gotten to a really good thickness. Now I don't really want to lose the height this year. I didn't protect it at all last year and it was absolutely fine. But if we go much below minus two, I think I will come out and wrap this stem in fleece just to preserve this height because when they're about this size, like the pups that have popped up next to it, they can get in the way a bit. Like this leaf is of a, another pup here and they just sort of battle for space in my garden, and my garden is not very big to have a huge clump of bananas. So I just need to separate the pups and kind of nurture the main plant until it flowers, and then I can replace it with one of these pups when the space becomes available. Now, just in front here, you can see a very sad looking Schefflera taiwaniana. Now this top growth was really, really badly damaged by the frost last winter. And it did actually start down the base. Let's see if it's still there. No, it's been slugged. It did start to recover at the base. Um, it's far from dead, but it's by no means a show-stopping award winner. So I'm gonna leave it as it is and we'll just see if it recovers next year. But it's gotten to a good size. I hope it recovers because they are nice plants, but I didn't touch it this year because I've got so much else going on. It wasn't too distracting with the rest of the planting. Now down here is an impatiens. You'll notice that I like to plant all the shade loving plants down the bottom so that they can tolerate the shade that all of the rest of the plants create as kind of the border grows and develops through the year. Now this impatiens is impatiens Flanaganii, which, yeah, it's quite nice foliage, it looks quite jungly, it's got these red stems. Now it does produce pink flowers, but for me it is so slow at producing flowers that 
I think this is going to go. And I've noticed, you see this soil down here? We have a resident mouse. Now I don't mind having mice in the garden. It's quite nice. This garden was just so bare and derelict when we moved in. Couldn't even find slugs or snails. So to get wildlife moving in, I'm happy about. I think they're eating the tubers off of this plant, which would explain why it's starved of energy. But yeah, I've tried it for a couple of years. It's not doing any good. So I think I'm gonna get rid of that and swap it out for something that's gonna match the big bold color scheme that we're gonna have in this central border next year. Something else that's done all right, but it's not looking too good at the moment is my Roldana Christobalensis with this lovely purple leaf. Now this leaf has been a bit snail beaten at the moment, but you can see looking at the stem there that I've been doing cuttings from this. Um, they'll be in the greenhouse all winter long. So I'm gonna leave this main plant outside just to see how it survives. I did leave the one that, lose the one that I left out last year, um, but I like to experiment. It's right up against the fence at the back. It's benefiting from this microclimate underneath all the evergreens. Um, the banana is a lot more established now, so maybe it will get through. But as I say, I've taken cuttings as a backup. And I've said it before, if you're worried about plants in winter, take cuttings, save seed, um, leave the main plants out and see if you can experiment. If it's something that you're really precious about, really worried about losing, perhaps you spent quite a bit of money on it or you've spent time growing it from seed, then by all means, dig it up and protect it in your greenhouse. But if you wanna see if you can push kind of the rule book and break rules in your garden and see what you can get away with, like I've done in the Grow Paradise Garden, then take cuttings, save seed and experiment. Don't be afraid to try something new. All right, just here, is Empatians tinctoria. This is called Dyer's Busy Lizzie, is a common name. This originates from South Africa and it is a tall growing Empatians. This one is up at my head height here, so about six foot tall, and it produces really beautiful, large white flowers with a red speckled throat that are sweetly scented at nighttime. Now I've mentioned in a recent video that this one hasn't flowered that much for me this year. And again, I think it's down to the fact that it didn't get enough light I really should have cut back these large banana leaves from the pup, the smaller banana here that's popped up by the main banana. And that actually shows the rate of growth. This is a pup that's popped up from the ground this year. So it's grown from there all the way into that giant in one summer. So if you're planting bananas, ideally make sure you've got enough space. Now this is my Fuchsia Boliviana, again, seed grown, but these tops are a sign that a nurseryman, AKA me, has been out here with secateurs taking stem cuttings, which means I'm gonna leave this plant out. I'm gonna experiment. I've seen them take temperatures of minus one, minus two before. Um, this top growth that's still quite herbaceous and hasn't gone woody will probably get frosted back. But down a bit lower than that, you can see woody material and as soon as a stem becomes woody it's a lot more cold resilient. Cold finds it a lot more difficult to penetrate material like that whereas herbaceous plant cells tend to freeze and rupture and that's what causes damage in plants. So this is the trick if you can get large growing plants to grow so vigorously in one growing season that a process of lignification the process of the cells turning woody can happen then you're massively increasing the chances that parts of this plant are gonna survive winter and will regrow quickly when the conditions are right in spring. Now, at the back here is my papaya tree and look how big this thing has grown. The leaves are enormous and the shape of the leaves is so exotic. And the main stem is covered in flowers there. Not only flowers, see there, there's fruit. I thought this plant needed a partner plant in order to get pollinated. Now I'm unsure. Um, there's mixed opinions about this online. Professional growers have told me I needed two plants in order for fruit to form. But you can see it, there is now fruit forming there. Perhaps the fruit might have unviable seed. So I'm gonna wait and see um, if I can get the fruit to ripen before the plant's frosted because it's not hardy 
If I can, I'm gonna save the seed and then I'm gonna try and sow it. The problem is this tree is going on for 10 foot tall now. That greenhouse isn't that tall. So if I am gonna overwinter it, I'm gonna to have to dig it up and have it kind of on a diagonal slant in the greenhouse just to allow time for these fruits to ripen. This banana is a seed-grown Musa sycamensis, commonly called the Darjeeling banana. This originates from the mountains of Sikkim in India, and this is said to be almost as hardy as the giant Musa basdu there. Now, you can see it's been really wind tolerant. It's allowed the coastal gust to blow through the leaves without that main leaf stem breaking. And it's got these lovely red markings. This is a plant that I am precious about because although they're quite common now, this is an example that I grew from seed. So I'd like to be able to protect that stem if possible. Now the stem's getting a good size. It's got this lovely silvery bloom on it, which makes it stand out compared to Musa Basdu, the red, regular banana. Um, so I will be sort of cutting back the leaves um, to protect this before any severe frost, but I'll be sure to share that process in a video guide showing you how I overwinter some of my banana plants. Now, one of them is this Musa cheesemanii. Again, seed grown with much narrower leaves, kind of a silvery blue midrib there. And this one has a really silvery stem that goes black down towards the base. Now, this is going to be easy to overwinter because it's growing in a pot. So I'm just going to have to carry that pot into the greenhouse. But I'm going to leave this out until the weekend, see what the forecast looks like, and then I might move it into the greenhouse just to keep it protected. down the bottom here is something I've not grown in the Grow Paradise Garden before, um, but it's done really, really well. It's Ceteria palmifolia. Now it looks like a giant palm seedling with these really nice corrugated leaves. It's actually a grass, a tropical grass, and it's said to have a reasonable degree of hardiness. I think it's gonna need good drainage. Um, so we'll see if it gets through planted down here where it is. But look at those leaves. It looks super tropical. It seems to have liked this partial shaded area here by the steel water bowl. And it's producing seed. So I've actually tried to grow this from seed before and I've not had any luck. I think the supplier sent me some very, very old and unviable seeds. So hopefully these seeds will be viable and I'll be able to grow a load more of these plants. There's actually a cultivar of this that's on my dream wish list, and it's got a really long name, but it's a purple form of this plant with kind of magenta pink streaks at the margins of the leaves. So if anyone has got any of that spare, send me a message, please. What else have we got here? Canna Tropicana Black. It's grown to about, I don't know, about a meter tall just foliage this year, no flowers. And I've mentioned in a previous video that I think that's because of the shade that this canopy cast over the top of it. But I don't mind too much because these leaves look tropical enough, but I will be digging up the canna, putting it into a container and then moving it elsewhere into a sunnier spot ready for next season. Here's my sugar cane. Now this Saccharum officinarum rubrum was a much more filler, fuller plant. I've been attacking this with my secateurs too. You can see some signs of a nurseryman coming by. It's currently in the greenhouse, being propagated, ready to produce new plants for next season. And here's a plant that I haven't featured that much. Um, I'm keeping it in a container because this is one of those plants that I wanna take with me if we move because it's very, very hard to find. This is actually an evergreen tree. I love these really long, narrow leaves. It reminds me a bit of a Pseudopanax. It's Podocarpus henkelii. And this one's growing on a single stem. It's, I think, completely hardy. It's been out in all the winters I've had it, three or four years. And I potted it on, so there's loads of fresh new growth here. It's a really, really nice evergreen tree, if you can find one. Um, it just, looks really, really exotic to me. It's almost willow-like with the leaves. And down the bottom, I've still got my aeoniums out. I will probably leave these out this weekend because they will take two or three degrees quite comfortably. 
if there's a sign of frost, I will protect them because I did an experiment last winter and I left all of my aeoniums out in the garden just to see how cold tolerant they would be and only two or three came back. These leaves are full of so much water that any kind of freezing temperatures just cause the cells to expand and die and you lose the whole rosette. Sometimes they will reshoot from this woody stem but I found it to be quite unreliable. Now a plant that has flowered for me reliably this year is this giant leaved salvia. This is salvia cerboana and the leaves grow enormous. So it really fits into a tropical style garden but it has these intense blue flowers up at about six foot tall. It's really, really vigorous. And blue is one of the rarest colors that you can find in plants. So it really, really catches your eye. And I think it looks great against the lush greens of a tropical style garden. And this has been completely hardy. It has enormous underground roots that overwinter really, really successfully, even in a deep freeze. So definitely one that's worth growing. I've saved seed from this, so I'm gonna try and grow some uh, for the Grow Paradise nursery next season. It's actually been quite laborious trying to find seed because you get these old pods here that start to form seeds and then we get wind and they all just disappear down into the gravel here on the dog side of the garden. Actually, while I'm on this side, I can give you a closer look at the papaya fruits. So I've got one, two, three. There's one more just here. And then a couple at the back. I'd really like to get these to ripen. I mean, there's so many more flowers, so potential for a lot more fruit there. And just look how tall it's got. I'm looking up from six foot tall, so this thing is towering. If I can get this to overwinter, I might just plant it out into the garden next year because at the rate that it's grown this year, it will probably be 20 foot competing with the bananas next season. So it'd be a bit of a spectacle and I won't mind losing it because hopefully I can grow younger plants from the seeds that it's producing. Now I've also got air plants here. This is just kind of a random collection of air plants that I've purchased over the years and I just tucked them into the fence here. They've even produced flowers and some of them are really sweetly scented. And while we're here, something I'd recommend doing now with cold weather forecast is to reset any of your maximum and minimum thermometers if you've got them. So I'm just gonna show you, it's currently 17 and a half degrees, so it's mad to think that it's gonna drop down to below five degrees. The warmest temperature the Grow Paradise Garden had this year was 46.4 degrees. Now, I live in an area that's got a lot of houses, a lot of tarmac, so it does get very, very, very hot. This temperature was likely to be when the sun was directly on this, but sometimes it's stifling out here. We can't come out in the garden unless we're under the shade of the plants. And the coolest temperature is this minus 5.2. That was the winter just gone. Now I'm gonna clear that and it's reset. So I'm gonna find out what the coldest temperatures are as the winter rolls in. And this is really important because I can come out, even if I decide to have a lay-in and see what the coldest point was that night and know what actions I need to take with any of these plants based on the temperatures that, that that thing shares with me. So if you haven't got one, I'll put a link in the description so that you can add one to your garden. Right, now around the base of this roost tree here are some plants that I've been growing in containers. These are my angel trumpets, my Brugmansia. These nice green leaves, the caterpillars have been munching on. Like I say, I don't mind sharing my garden with the wildlife. It's really nice to see wildlife moving in. And at this time of year, these plants are gonna be defoliated soon by the cold weather. And as I prepare to overwinter them, so it's not an issue, I can share. But because we've had so much warm temperature late in the year, they're producing flower buds. So I'm actually tempted to leave these out and see how they cope with a short period of cold weather this weekend. Um, if they do show any signs of stress, because they're in containers, I can just grab them and move them into the greenhouse and it won't be a problem at all. Now you'll see that I've also got some other bromeliad here, some larger ones that need a bit of a tidy up. They're catching all of the leaf litter as the roost tree sheds its canopy in preparation for winter. This larger one is Bilbergia. 
This is a hybrid form. And this is Acmea blanchettiana. No, it's not. It's um, Acmea orlandiana and a cultivar called Ensign. And this one's vicious. I have no idea why I decided to put it by the footpath. Catches my ankles every time. <laughs> this fern, I haven't featured on the channel much this year. This is Woodwardia radicans. Now this is actually a European fern. So it's really well adapted to growing in a UK climate. It's evergreen, so long as we get mild winters. And each leaf, this one's a baby, and the leaves are already about a metre, a metre and a half long. They can grow enormous. And it's called the walking fern because it has this ability. It produces little bulbils on the top of the tip of the leaves, and it will root down wherever this leaf arches and touches, and it will produce a new plant, and it will slowly move along a garden and colonise an area. Now, with the winter we had last, the leaves that were on the plant were completely frosted off, damaged and turned brown and died back. But you can see how quickly it's recovered from that central knuckle there. So it's definitely a plant that I would call hardy. It doesn't necessarily look great if you get a cold winter, but it recovers quickly and you get these enormous jungly leaves. And I think ferns are essential to create a jungle look in your garden. It's not all about the big, bold, taller plants. You need to cover the lower levels, just like in a rainforest as well. And if you look at any pictures or documentaries about a rainforest, the lower level is always covered in ferns. Now, as well as Woodwardia radicans, I've got native ferns here. I like to combine native plants with these exotics because it provides value for the wildlife, but it also means that there's some low effort plants in the garden. They've kind of adapted to cope with this climate really, really well. Now, I think this is a dryopteris fern. These were planted two or three years ago when we had a stream running through the garden here and there was a pond. And there's a fern on this side and one on there and they flanked either side of, of the stream and the stream flowed where this gravel path is now. And they've kind of remained in these spots no matter how many changes have happened in the garden. They do get slightly frosted back. You can see some old foliage here, but they quickly push out lush new leaves. And I think this delicate fern alongside the much more tough looking Woodwardia radicans is quite a nice combo. Right, I think we've covered the jungle border, the central bed. Let's have a look at this narrow shady border. Now we'll start at the top. This is my Griselania littoralis. I've said before that this border takes the brunt of the coastal winds, cold winds and storms through the winter months. So my taller plants here are sacrificial plants that diffuse the wind that blows through the rest of the garden to protect some of the more exotic plants in the collection over on this side. And Griselania littoralis is a very, very tough, very, very common plant, but this variegated leaf, I think, makes it combine really well with kind of bold tropical style planting. Now the littoralis plant, part of this plant's name, means coastal, copes with coastal conditions well. So this is gonna be able to shrug off any salt laden winds that blast across the garden really well. And when I planted it this year, well, it was lower than this bench here, and you can see it's already grown up to this height and it's just breached the top of the boundary fence. So it's gonna help diffuse any winds that are blowing through. The next sacrificial plant is this Prunus laurocerasus, the cherry laurel. Again, a super common plant, something that you can pick up from B&Q or any local garden center. It grows vigorously, so it doesn't matter if it gets completely damaged in winter because it's gonna pick up the same size again in no time at all. And it's just gonna diffuse those winds coming through the garden. Now, this is the height I like to keep it. It's, this boundary fence is maybe four or five foot tall. And it's just high enough that one, it creates a sense of seclusion inside the garden doesn't make it feel like we're overlooked at all, but it's also doubling up as a bit of protection from the severe storms in winter. Next to that, contrasting with the green leaves, is Sambucus nigra, and this is a cultivar called Blue Sheen, because when the light catches it right, it has almost like a blue iridescence to it. Now, this plant, if you grow Sambucus, you will know is really, really vigorous. Again, this one has value to wildlife because it produces pink flowers in spring, great for the pollinators, 
and there's a few berries left, but the birds have had the rest. So I like to find things that can bring wildlife into the garden. It's not just for me, it's for all of the passing wildlife as well. And then a golden leaf tree that contrasts really nicely against the dark leaf of that Sambucus is our golden Indian bean tree. Now the Latin name for this one is Catulpa bignonioides aurea. And it has these huge heart-shaped leaves that are really, really golden, even on a dull lake day like this. Today it's sort of drizzling on me as I'm doing this video, but they're still catching the light and really brightening it up. And that golden theme picks up on that griselenia that we first looked at on the other end of the bed and ties down to this golden grass, which is a chorus gramineus that I've planted all the way along the front of this border and it ties the whole bed together really, really nicely. And that's another tip. I'd recommend using variegated plants like this, like the golden variegated grass, to brighten up shady areas. If I just used all dark greens here, this area would look so much darker. But by using brightly variegated plants, it just lifts it and adds color. And because this is evergreen, this is evergreen, it's gonna still look bright even through the dark winter months. Another variegated plant that I use here is this Fatsia japonica, and this is variegata, because it has these creamy variegated marks, usually around the leaf margins. This one isn't quite as hardy as the regular japonica, and it's definitely much slower growing, but it's got these really exotic looking leaves. They're thick and glossy, and in most winters for me, they look this good all year round. And this will produce um, ivy-like blooms in late winter, which are absolutely covered with bees and pollinating insects, which is great, because at that time of year, there's not that many plants in tropical style gardens that are providing resources for pollinators. Now let's have a look at some of the plants that we've got lower in this border. So we've got our tropical bromeliads, just like the ones I'm growing in that roost tree. In the center, I'm gonna keep these bromeliads out for as long as possible, but I will move them indoors if temperatures drop below about two degrees Celsius, because I don't want to risk any damage on the leaves. Down low, we've got our Saxifraga stolonifera, which is commonly sold as a house plant, but has been a really prolific ground cover plant for me in the Grow Paradise Garden. You can see it's covered in some fallen leaves at the minute, but it's great. Sometimes it's called the strawberry begonia because of this red side and slightly begonia looking leaves. Um, but it just walks and walks and walks. So it's going under the plant bench here. It's a great ground cover plant and it's actually really herbaceous. So you wouldn't think it's evergreen, but it's done really well. And in spring you get really dainty, almost orchid looking flowers. I definitely like to try and source more cultivars of this style of Saxifraga because for me, it looks super exotic. And to have such a resilient plant act as a ground cover plant in difficult conditions like this, next to patio slabs, under a bench, underneath evergreen shrubs. They are really, really useful. Now next to that is the now tired looking leaves of Brunera macrophylla. And this is a cultivar called Sea Heart. There's also Alexander's grape planted next to it. Now Brunera is great. You get blue flowers in spring. You get these beautiful looking leaves all summer long that are mostly untouched by slugs and snails. And then it's herbaceous, so it will die back to ground level and will regrow again in spring. At the back, I've got evergreen ferns. This is Polystichum munitum or something like that. I think it's called the sword fern. Again, really, really tough, waxy leaves. So they're really, really good at shaking off cold weather. And I've put them at the back, so when all this herbaceous material dies at the front. These come into their own in winter. So we're going to have the combo of the evergreen ferns, evergreen larger shrubs, and this evergreen frontage of the bed so that there is always something to look at all the way through the year. Now this Begonia grandis has really come into its own this year. This is a completely hardy Begonia. It spends most of the year producing these really nice lush jungly leaves that have this glossy red underside. And then 
late in the season, it produces sprays of these blooms. Now this is Begonia grandis Evantiana alba because it's got white leaves. Down at the bottom here is a Begonia grandis, and I think this is a cultivar called Heron's Pirouette. Now I have no idea how this one got here. I didn't plant it. About four or five years ago, I had one of these growing there. How it's managed to get from there to there, I don't know. All I can think is perhaps one of the bulbils because they produce little bulbils along the stems. May have been in a pot and I may have tipped that pot out into this bed thinking it was empty. And then this has popped up. There's actually another one popping up here, but it's not, yeah, that's pink flowers. I think that's what I've done, but I don't mind. Happy accident, that's what we'll call it. But that looks great. Now this jungly looking leaf is an amorpha phallus, and this is Atra viridis. It's actually more commonly sold as a house plant, but it's got these really nice pink leaf margins and a silvery underside. And this mottled kind of maroon burgundy stem. Now it was clipped into this stake before to hold the leaf upright and then in a recent storm it's blown over and I've just sort of left it to do its thing because this will go dormant soon um, and it will die back to that terracotta pot and I will move that pot into the greenhouse and keep it dry through winter to protect it before this leaf regrows again. But this has been a really nice addition. I like to call it house plants on holiday. When you find a plant that you think is going to look great in your garden but you know it's got no hardiness at all just move it outside for the warm summer months and it's going to really kind of add that tropical feel to your garden and you're going to see that plant looking much happier because it's getting daylight and rainwater and just really really thriving. Now back here is an Iochroma. Now Iochroma are in the same family as Brugmansia but they're said to be hardy. Now that stick at the back there was one that I planted out last winter and it did not look happy. Now through the year it's grown maybe 30 centimetres but that's it, it's not produced any flowers. It did survive, yeah it's hardy but it didn't do much afterwards. I might dig this up and try and overwinter it to see if I can get it to be much more vigorous and flower a bit more next season. Down here Tucked under here is a shade loving fern. Again, this looks like the maidenhair fern, which is normally sold as a house plant, but this is a hardy relative of that. This is Adiantum venustum. And it will remain evergreen in a mild winter. Um, but if we get a frost, I'm expecting it to die back and act like any other herbaceous perennial. But these delicate leaves contrast really nicely against kind of these big thick leaves of this begonia. Now another begonia is this one with the orange flowers, Begonia Sutherlandii. And this is a cultivar called papaya because the flowers are the same color as a papaya fruit. And this one is now dying back because we've had the cold, but it's covered in bulb bells. Let's see if I can find one. So that brown bit there is actually a bulb bell. That has formed along one of the leaf axles of the plant and that will drop to the ground, just like that, and will regrow. It's a nice way that the plant vegetatively reproduces itself. So this is going to come back bigger and better every single year. Now, if you want to, you can find these bulbils, pick them up and put them into a pot and grow them on as a separate plant, as a nice way of propagating the plant. But I'm happy for that one to reproduce there. And then my trusty Begonia pedata feeder. Now I've seen people selling this as Pedartafida red petiole because it's got the red stems, but I've only ever sold this as the standard Pedartafida. And this is another hardy begonia. This is actually growing in a container because I like to split the rhizomes ready for propagation and growing it in a container just makes that so much easier. Um, but it's still really, really vigorous in that container. And then a plant that I used to rave about but has not actually done that well this year for me is this. This is Farfugium aureomaculatum. Now it's got a really nice leaf. 
It is evergreen, but the slugs love these just as much as they love hostas. I think what I'm going to do with this one is dig it up, containerize it, because they are quite hard to find, um, and then bulk it out in a pot in the protection of the greenhouse through winter, and then use this as a propagation plant rather than plant it out in the garden here as a display plant. I mean, the leaves do look great. These yellow blotches match the golden variegated grass really well, but it's just sort of lost in the border now. Now that there's plants that have been much more successful. Okay, I admit that video was a bit rambly and a bit of a one take wonder, but hopefully it's given you some ideas for plants that you might want to add to your garden and given you some inspiration to see how a tropical style garden could actually look so late into the year in a country like the UK. Now I would love to see pictures of how your gardens are looking at the moment and you can post them for free over on the Grow Paradise social network. It's growparadise.social, you sign up there and it's just like Facebook for gardeners where you can join gardening groups and post questions and answer other people to help each other out. I look forward to seeing your pictures over there. Thank you so much for watching and if you've enjoyed this video, please hit subscribe. It's the easiest way to support this channel. I'll see you all in the next one.